Well, my real name is John Pandridge, which is a Polish Scottish name, because my parents come from Dundee originally, my dad. And uh, when I was at school, I used to play the piano in a jazz band, but I was also very interested in minerals and fossils, and I really wanted to be a prospector of some sort, a mining engineer of metal. And so they nicknamed me Panhandle as a joke. And when I started playing the piano in the trad band at school, they started just calling us Johnny Handel. So that was how the name, John, the nickname Johnny Handel came about. And I got stuck with it in the musical scene through jazz and folk. So that's what I go up by. You know, people know me as Johnny Handel. That explains that bit. Um, I was born in 1935. Um, my dad was a school teacher. My mum came from a mining family in County Durham. A uh, granddad was a stable keeper, and a brother Tom was a deputy in the in the pits at Washington. Uh, I went. I was evacuated during the war for four years out at Hexham, and uh, and then I came back to Newcastle and uh, went to Heaton Grammar School and left uh, under a haze of jazz and not very successful attempts to start the sixth form and went in the coal mines as a pit lad. Uh, my dad was rather put out with that because he thought I should get a degree. However, um, we cycled, a lot of people cycled in those days, <coughs> around the collieries to the north and west of Newcastle which he did in those days. He didn't go to the door office up in the papers. He went to the pit and asked if any, you know, he could be set on. <clears throat> so I was set on at a coal mine called Dudley, seven miles north of Newcastle. And there I worked as a surface hand uh, until my name came up for face training, for underground training. And then I was sent to Bedlington each day for 16 weeks and taught all the, the ways of working underground, of which are many. But that, that'll take a long time to explain, because you need to understand how to get the coal and, and, and how to handle yourself underground and how to deal with various types of equipment. And then I went underground at Dudley, and the manager said, as long as you stick in at the tech college, I'll make sure that you don't work any longer on one job in three weeks, and then we'll get moved around from job to job. So you may have to stand at the bottom of the shaft like a slave, waiting for instructions, but you will see a lot of the different types of what they call datal work. That means work that was paid the same wage every week. So that was the way it went. But at 18, the shock horror, I started going from permanent day shift to one week on day shift, that's eight till four, and then the next week from four on four shift, midnight till eight o'clock in the morning. And the traveling in the winter proved a little bit severe. Um, so I got a job at a colliery near Newcastle called North Walbottle, where I was for 16 weeks. And then an apprenticeship came up with the surveyors. So I took that apprenticeship and studied to become a surveyor. And at the time I was an apprentice surveyor, uh, I was work working at eight different collieries within the area to the west of Newcastle, um, with the surveyor's unit, as they call it. So I, in those mines, there was every kind of mine, from a small mine that's only 80 feet deep on the edge of the coral measures, um, to ancient deep mines like the Montague Colliery on the edge of the river at Newcastle that originally was sunk near the river to get the keel boats away and then gradually got deeper and deeper and further away from the river till it ended up about six miles away from the river and the second shaft had been sunk nearer to the workings and eventually uh, the sister pit of that next door, North Walbottle, put a drift from the surface uh, near Newcastle Airport so that the workers could go down the drift 
and get to the cold face instead of having to walk underground for a long time. So there was a lot of different types of mining involved there. Um, and during that time, uh, I was involved in making what we call the abandonment plans for some collieries as an apprentice and later an assistant, where the collieries had used up all the coal, uh, which in those days was the reason for closing a colliery that exhausted the coal reserves. That was before the, they needed to make a lot of money out of the coal. So some seams worked at a loss, whereas other seams in the same coal mine made so much profit that it was worth keeping the coal mine open. Uh, and then when I qualified, I went to work at the Rising Sun Colliery as the head assistant. That was a deeper mine at Wall's End. And uh, it was a different ball game altogether because they didn't have tubs in the, as the main part. They had tubs in one part, but the main type of getting the coal out was huge mine cars and uh, diesel and electric locomotives underground and machinery, machine faces. And, uh, and all very hydraulic and automatic loading into the cages, huge cages. Um, and then I went to work for ICI for about a year as a draftsman, but that wasn't very successful. They, they all had the plant designs, and so it was a question of moving to uh, Middlesex or Bristol to keep the ICI job or been made redundant with a comfortable payoff. So I took the payoff and got a job at Ellington as a surveyor under the sea. But in the meantime, I got involved with the folk music. We were starting the first folk song club in Newcastle with a singer called Louis Kiln. Um, after the Skiffle era, would move from, I'd moved from jazz to American songs and blues, and then got interested in local songs. So as the folk movement progressed, I became more and more interested in the songs of the, the area, because unlike other parts of Britain where the songs have sort of passed from person to person without thinking, who wrote these? Round here, there was a, a, a lot of publishers and broadsheet sellers who were keen to publish local songs and therefore you could trace the songs and trace the area they came from. So there's a lot to go at, a lot of collections. And so I got interested in finding all the mining songs I could. And when there wasn't a suitable mining song to cover a subject, I would write one from my own experience in the coal mines or from the experiences of people who I worked with or I, I kept in touch with because there was quite a few was trained at Bedlington and we all went to various collieries after that, uh, but some of us kept in touch and occasionally would meet and have a drink uh, so I could find out what was happening at various other collieries and discuss the development of machinery. And lot miners are very interested in how a pit works and how you get coal. In fact, a lot of the miners used to tell me as a surveyor where the reserves of the coal mine were and where it, they were driving drifts to look, find another part of the coal mine that could forecast where the coal would be because they had a three-dimensional uh, approach to, to thinking underground and they were quite enthusiastic about finding out how their pit worked and, and whether they were going to work any longer or whether they were going to be made redundant as time rolled on and uh, arguments raised hot and strong about reserves of coal they knew about and the management weren't using it. It was, uh, it was very constructive in a way. And they were all in it together because the coal board had nationalised the pits. And there was a feeling that initially, certainly, that it was a good thing. And not the sort of, we're all going to pull together boys and this is jolly good. It was just a natural thing that they, they, they knew about mining and its hardships. But it was a community and the villages were established. The idea that if you lived at the village, you worked at the pit and there was some security. Or as the ladies in the village, the lasses would say, 
way of Pittman's a grand country now, isn't he? Because look what you're going to get. You get married of a Pittman, you put in for a Corius, that's going to save you a fortune on the mortgage. Then you get 12 ton of coal, you. Your horse will never be card. And, and then think about your man, he's safe. He's not going to put his hand up a secretary's blouse or skirt in the tune. He's doing air working with men. It's a proper job, man. It's a mature job. And then there's an added bonus that you've never thought about. You get a free load of shite every year from the stables. So that means you can get his allotment and it'll be fertilised. And when he's not at the pit or at the pub or at the dogs or watching the tune fail again, he'll be doing allotment. And again, he's not putting his hand up a lassie's skull. So, what a catch. Man, Pittman used to be fighting the lasses off. And particularly the putters. Because putting was the job that you could get on piecework before you had face trained. So everybody went down underground and they were on dental money, the same money, on haulage. But the people who worked on the face and the conscious, the stone men, they got paid piecework. But you couldn't do that until you were trained. So you put your name down if you wanted to go training. And then if your father was on the store committee or in the league club or the Labour Party, you got a good chance of getting up the list. And then your name came up, you went to a training phase in an, sometimes in an old part of the country and you learned to use coal cutters, drills, advanced conveyors, put arched girders in for stonework, everything to do with a coal face. And then you come out and you went straight on the big money. Sometimes three times as much as Dale. So, but there was one job before you were face trained where you got piecework and that was putting. And if you were a hand putter, that meant you pushed the tubs into the coal face and brought them out. So the legs was like pit props. But it was good money. Shilling a tub, I think, when I was an apprentice. I was getting out as a civilian apprentice, but the lads I knew, I trained with, and you can always tell the putters when they were 17, 18, 19 year old, because in the club, when they went for a drink, there would be two lasses with them, one on either side, because they were into the money. And we were sitting, all the lads together, and then other lasses would sit next to us because we had an out, because we were on deal. So there you go, the putters were, but they had to be strong. But we got a bit of chair of putting when I was surveying because boards and walls, that's where they'd leave a pillar in. You surveyed all around that. But you couldn't survey when they were pushing the coals in and out. So we would help them to push the coals in and out, generally taking empty ones in fast. And they would get the face off quick. So then they would come and they knew they would be finished maybe an hour early if me and the apprentices was helping them. Sometimes it would help to do a bit of measuring and it would all get out sharp. So we're quite keen to help one with a pudding. And you had to learn everything with a pudding. Also, if the tub got off, you'd get your arse behind it. It's like lifting pianos up, you know. If they good stretching over that, it'll just burn you. That's where they'd say arse, arse on, get the arse against the tub. So there was primitive methods of working. Hand pudding. Uh, and then, of course, if the idea was also there was pony pudding, but sometimes they put you in hand pudding where they didn't want to take too much cancer off the top, and it was cheaper to have hand pudding than take extra roof to let the pony in. So, but the. So the that's a, a sketch of, of, but finally at Ellington, out under the sea, it became a realisation that they were closing the pits right, left and centre in the 70s. So I had all my tickets to be a mining surveyor, of which every colony must have an appointed mining surveyor. But there were so many mining surveyors made redundant, I'd never had the chance. 
to get the next rung up the ladder. So I decided to become a school teacher and take a mature students course. That's for people who don't wash very much and they smell very mature. Uh, anyway, I, it only took two years with the qualifications I had in mind to become a school teacher. And I wasn't very keen on the teaching because I wasn't very good at it the first year. And the incomprehensible schools were awful places. Uh, it was like the Cold War before it was nationalised, you know, the old ideas. The new students took the roughest kids without much idea how to control them. So I, I was taking the rough kids for a year and then I got a, a, a chance to go and sing for a special school in the castle one afternoon when I was off. And the head said, would you like to come and talk about working here? And I thought, why? So either that or gone back down the pit. So I came and talked to them. It was very relaxed and and then he said, all right, okay, well. I said, will I have an interview? Will you let? No, he said, you've just had it, you've got the job. It was, that was what it was like in those days. So I stayed in special needs for all my teaching because I had the same bunch of kids all the time. And it was really parallel because in the pit, you got to know people in a certain community in the pit and you could relate to them. And they looked after their own special needs kids in the villages. Because even when I was working at Dudley, there was lads that they they didn't have a lot upstairs, but they learned to do jobs and manual jobs in the pit, and they got their wages regularly. And if they were a bit daft in the village, they would keep an eye on them when they went to the club and spent a bit of money. And so the communities looked after their own. And that was one of the most important things I noticed about it. For example, Dudley four shift. I got the, started getting the bus instead of going on my push bike in the winter. The last bus from Newcastle and Dudley got to the pit at half past ten. But I wasn't due to go down till midnight. So then I was sitting in the lamp cabin doing my homework for the tech. And one of the lads that I trained with mentioned this to his father and his father came to me and said, you're not going to stop in the lamp cabin, are you? And I says, well, who's that? That's what I've, I've got in the bus. He says, no, when you're on four shift, you're coming to our house and you're going to have supper with us. And they gave him cards, not for money, just, but you're not real money. And so that was their attitude drawn in. And they were like that, very, they were, they were, I mean, they were like any community, some of them would fall out occasionally. Uh, but they were there for each other. And I think that was an important part of the, and I, when the pitch shut, one of the problems was the communities started breaking up because some of them said, great, it's the best thing I've had did, take the money and run. But then not everybody, it's like retirement, not everybody can form a, a totally new lifestyle. And some of the training that were given to work on the surface um, wasn't really the sort of same thing as working down the pit. And one of the worst things, which I mentioned in one of my poems, they were, they were trained for industry and then found themselves working in a factory making plastic dollies in, in somewhere in Durham. And I thought this was... I went back to Dudley years later after the pit had shut and wrote a poem called The Art Shull after I'd been to Dudley because there was just the tub at the crossroads, you know, the, the, the obligatory tub to remind you, like, to have a bit of a pulley wheel. And yet down in the allotment, there was still, there was still the, the feeling. And I saw somebody with an old face shovel in the allotment, you know, the big round shovel. Small shovel for, for stone men, big shovel for the coal men, because the stones are heavier, naturally, you know. And there was a, somebody leaning on it, and I thought, him and his grandfather have probably brought that out of the pit and treasured it as a relic, a symbol, you know. If London's so far away and they're making laws,
for us so far away. Then there's a, a gathering together of people, if you like, in the same way as people are against politicians today. They're also against the institution and the idea that it costs so much for people to live in London and yet there's more and more people living there. Curious. And we were doing canny, where we had work. There was the shipyards, the engineering and the coal mines and the fishing. That was great. And the parts worked together and we were going canny. They were down there, but we had our own scene. So there was a feeling that, that we were not exactly self-sufficient, but we were fairly self-supporting. And uh, even the, the farming communities interlocked because there was the, the need for the, the food supplies. So you could get food that was reared locally. But with the advent of transport all over Blum and Place, it began to fall apart. Even Newcastle has football players that don't come from Newcastle. Isn't that surprising? And nearly every other football team in Britain. <laughs> so it's 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 moving. It's it's but whether it's going to stay together, the links that are still there because of the family and the geography, don't know. There is the other problem about living somewhere and having to move to another part of Tyneside. They were so used to living, like the people in this village would live here and work at the coal mine, at the back of this pub. And a lot of people in there, see it, two thirds of the people worked at the pit. Fortunately, the village is within a travelable distance to Newcastle, but even so, they're still working in a community that has this regional accent and he may say, well, it's a bit of a backward approach, sort of, a, but there's nothing wrong about having a collective approach and a collective approach to community and ideas. Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll never be a spinner. I've been here 20 years. It's but also because I've got no relatives in Spain. I think the thing is, the family reaches back and the family puts roots in a place. Take the school, for example. I used to do, after I retired from the special school, I, I started teaching part time, and I, part of the time I was teaching at this school. Now, I just met one of my pupils recently at the league show as it happens. Great big gangland kid. How are you getting on, sir? Can I get your pint, sir? And he was one of the Bullerwells, who, you know. They're the farming people. All of the, one boy and wrote five lasses, all musical, so I got to know them all. They're the farming people that fit into this community. But they've always been farmers. The people who worked at the pit probably went generations back at the pit. So there's a sense of belonging. But there's also a link with the Aborigines in the sense of superstitions. Because they they are conscious of things like luck. I mean, I know there's the standard thing about Holy Island fishermen won't go out if you see a pig, but several other people, if, uh, fishing communities, you'll find that. But the, the mining communities are a little bit peculiar in their superstitions. And they're, they're, it's linked to religion as well. I mean, it, it, there was always the Methodist chapels and then the Catholic people and then the Church of England. But there was a lot of sense of community related to this. You didn't have to be a drinker to be, have a social life. There was always social life between the pubs. Sometimes you had to decide. The Methodists weren't all that keen on it. But there is the respect for the past. The, the George Cross won in the First World War. The children designed the, the, the war memorial and when the light gets on a particular time, it shines through the war memorial. The kids decided they wanted to do that. And the, the Millennium Play, that they, I was asked to direct, produce whatever it is, with the kids. They wanted to have the schoolyard in the play, first act, in Victorian times. Then the schoolyard in modern times, 
in the schoolyard in the future, with the tide flooding, and ships going up the Hexham, going down to the, the Bladen docks, you know, the liners coming into Bladen docks. Very imaginative, the kids, with a magic carpet going in between. The kids designed all this and worked out Victorian. But the school was a Victorian school. So they were very interested in that. And of course, their mums and dads and relatives. And they it. And in the same way as the Aborigines go back to their particular places. So, even though the pit should, they'll still tell you in relationship to the pit or where the crossings were. Do you remember when the, the railway engine went main on the crossings and events relating to that? They'll tell you stories about that. And they're very good stories. I was listening to one last week. Tom on our street used to be a cutter. And eventually went to be an orbman, but he was in the, he was at the uh, the drift and he had the cutter's hip because the sea was only eighteen inches. And so you know Anyway, he has lots of stories about the cutting at the, at the drift from the Tropwell Colliery. And he was saying that there was a group of young lads at, at Tropwell Colliery under the supervision of one particular person, Dittle Hands. And he said the lads liked to play the fool a bit. And this old man in charge of them had a gammy leg. And normally they got on with them all right. But he had a prodigious appetite and brought this bait box, like a brick shithouse, as they said but we might call it a rather large container for his sandwiches. Anyway, with it being a drift, animals can get into the drift. You get rats going in the drift, they migrate in and out according to the spring or, or, or the winter. Uh, and you've got to get out of the way if, you, if the rats, because they come at it as a pack. You get sparrows down the pit, coming down with the choppy. You get a cat in the stables. Um, and of course, this pit had bats that they got in. So one day, Tom and his friend caught a bat. So when the boss, the oldman, was away looking after some of the lads, they opened his bait tin, buried down the sandwiches, and put the bat in between two packs of sandwiches. And then everybody stopped for bait, including the face workers. And Tom managed to persuade the face workers to have their lunch that day around where this old man was sitting. And everybody knew there was a bat in his sandwiches. And of course, as they were getting nearer and nearer to the, the sandwich in question, the tension rose until the bat flew out and Tom flew around in a rage. And, and uh, not, sorry, the old man flew around in a rage and chased Tom with the dreg, that's the device that he was to stop the tubs by pulling between the spokes. And they said, with his peg leg, he'd now got a speed on with a drag. And I thought it was a wonderful statement. And he managed to catch up with them and give them a hogan. But they said it was worth it. <laughs> that is a wonderful story. And he, people, you know, people have tell that story long after, you know, Thomas Deed. So uh, the, there is a consider and within when the mines were working, they would tell you about places that had been finished. They, like the time I first met a cat in the pit, they t told me in this particular pit, part of the pit that there's been a man died in the old workings, and they hadn't got his body out, and he was always trying to get out the ghost. Now, whether or not it was a young lad having the Mickey taken of him, I don't know. But they said whenever you went past that on your way into the coal face, you had to listen very carefully, and you would hear, sometimes you would hear him moaning, wanting to be out. So I was going in by this day, and doing the standard thing. The conveyor was going past with the coal on. You walk along the rally way, try not to trip over the, the the sleepers, and your lamps going down this all the time because there might be parts of the roof that's sticking down a bit, you know. So you're doing this all the time. And suddenly my light caught on these green eyes coming along the conveyor. And it was right past this place where this bloke had died. And there was nobody else in the district at the time. So I thought, oh God, what's this? And I thought, somebody's been injured and the quickest way to get him out to put him on the conveyor. But the eyes didn't look human. 
I thought, no, is this somebody that's deed? And they could put, there would be somebody with them, surely. So I was looking for anybody else, lights coming in the distance, no lights. And the eyes got nearer and nearer, and I started feeling the hairs going up on the back of my neck. So I thought, this is the ghost, and this riding out on the conveyor. Can it be that, really? Uh, and the eyes got nearer, and a little sound went, Brrr! and the cat jumped off the conveyor and rubbed itself against my legs. I bugger nearly shit myself. And I, I later found out that when you go in by, when it gets hotter and hotter as the ventilation gets worse, you leave your coat on a, at a certain place on a series of hooks, all the coats together. And of course, one of the old shifters that was working with us, one of the days that I learned about this, when we're coming back, he said, Daddy, I clears, man, Daddy, I clears. So I says, oh, what for? He says, I'll show you. So he went round Dad in the courts. And sure enough, a mouse jumped out of the pocket of one of the courts because he had a few crumbs in. And the mice knew to go from wherever they were in the pit, which was usually near the stables where there was straw and, you know, seeds. They could smell this and they would travel half a mile to go and get the... And perhaps even live on the, the roasting, pro, uh, rotting props around this, you know, where the coat's home. But the cat knew as well and went from the stables where it lived to keep the mice down all the way the half mile to see if there was any mice. But the cat, being clever, wouldn't walk back. It was easier to jump on the conveyor. And that was it. <laughs>